Uh, thank you very much for, for coming to this Sunday morning session uh, at 8.30. I hope everyone who was present at the ACME thing last night had a really good time. Uh, Melbourne has a lot to offer and despite that there's a, there's a really good uh, attendance here and I'm sure we're, the speakers will be very grateful for that. Uh, I'm David A. Scott, I'm the President of ANSCA and it's my privilege today to introduce this morning's session. Uh, prior to that I'll just remind you of the usual housekeeping uh, things. Um, that, uh, that there are, is the app, of course, that you can download and interact with. Uh, there's Wi-Fi uh, that you can connect to, and there are tweets that you can send. So please, uh, please interact and send and broadcast uh, your uh, <coughs> feelings about things as they go along. These are plenary sessions, so we, they will, there will not be question uh, and answer at the end of each session, but I'm sure the speakers will be around uh, at the end uh, to finish. So I, ha I, my, I have great pleasure of, of reintroducing uh, Professor Ole Lundqvist. Uh, many of you will have already heard him speak during this, this conference. Uh, professor Lundqvist is a professor of surgery at the University of Örebro in S Sweden, and he is a long-time uh, active engager and driver of the processes of ERAS. And ERAS, as we know, is, is uh, an approach to uh, enhanced recovery after surgery to integrate processes and to improve outcomes. And uh, whilst, uh, as we've, we've heard from some sources, it's not necessarily a dogmatic religion, it's certainly a movement. And uh, I'm hoping we'll, we'll hear much more about that today. Uh, the title of this presentation is ERAS, A Metabolic Journey. And I understand it's going to encompass aspects of both metabolism and journeys. And I look very forward to hearing uh, Professor Ole Lundqvist. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that uh, kind introduction. And I'd like to extend my thanks to the organizers, uh, Guy, Simon, and uh, Colin, for the kind invitation and uh, extraordinary hospitality that I've been treated with here. It's fantastic. Yeah, I'm going to uh, take you through uh, uh, this journey uh, from the, a very personal point of view and through the development of the ERA Society. And, uh, Actually, I'm going to start off in a very serious, at a very serious note. This is my partner in crime, Ken Fearon, a surgeon, a brilliant surgeon from Edinburgh, and uh, also uh, one of the best researchers in surgery of modern times, I would say. Very sadly and very suddenly passed away two weeks ago. So uh, this presentation is really uh, to honor his uh, work and uh, his participation in this. Without him, we would not be where we are today. So, Ken, this is for you. Uh, I also need to disclose, yes, I did co-found the ERA Society. I was also involved in starting up a company that helped us with administration and IT on behalf of the group, and I've also been given some advice to nutrition companies. But let's start off like this. Um, we have a growing and aging population. We all know that. There's pressure all the time for better results, and we have diminishing funding. So our job is really to produce better care for less cost, and it's nice if we do it fast. And uh, so just take a look at what surgery and anesthesia is today. Well, 5% of the population in the Western world is going to be operated every year. So that means that in my country, for example, we will have four operations through our lifetime on average. WHO says it's more than 300 million operations annually frightening thing with these numbers and the huge portion of, of medicine that surgery actually consists is that best practice is not in use. And it takes a very long time to put a novel, good information, good new practices into, into use. So ERAS, the way we look at it is that we aim to help lead the way to make sure that we have continuous input of the novelties of evidence-based medicine. And we do that in different ways. Just a few words about the variation in care. This is a slide that has been shown before uh, during this conference, but it shows the, it's actually a logarithmic scale of the variation in the risk of dying after surgery in the European countries. And what it shows is that there's a huge variation between different countries. That may not be so surprising, but if you go to a single country, and this is a slide I got from Mike Scott, you can see how just a few years ago, and it's still there, but maybe not to exactly the same extent, but this is the variation in length of stay from 23 to three days. 
in the same country in different hospitals for the same operation. Now, you may wonder if that's actually acceptable. And then you look at a single unit, and this is again a slide I've gotten from a friend of mine. A single unit, four surgeons deciding on their perioperative care quite differently, and you know, uh, certainly on their own. And this is a, a subsequent patients, the variation in length of stay for all their patients over a period of time. Now, fortunately, Ron Collins, whom I got this slide from, an anesthetist, he decided to convince everybody to do enhanced recovery. And these are the first 20 patients who got you know, much less variation, but evidence-based care. And you can see immediately how that variation drop or shrinking actually gave results in outcomes as well. The other thing that's a main problem is the time that I mentioned of adoption of new knowledge. And this is Henry Kellett, who is uh, really the forefather of all of this because he was the one who conceptually he put together the conceptions of the multimodal rehabilitation program many, many years ago and actually published his results already in 1999. So he proved the, the, that it was possible to have people recover, at least, very quickly enough to go home after a major operation, two days after sigmoid resections. Now keep that two days in mind as we go along because we'll be showing some more numbers as we move on. Now that was in 1999. Last year, this was headlines in the Wall Street Journal. Isn't that amazing? It's the same thing. So that's how long it actually takes. And this is some figures that uh, would just reflect where we are with uh, length of stay for these operations. In the UK, USA, and Sweden, we're talking about eight days for the colonic resections. France, Italy, Spain, higher. These are numbers I just got from a good friend of mine, Robert Thomas, who's with the government here in Victoria. So it's uh, apparently 11 days here in Victoria. And uh, in Japan, it might be even longer. OK, so those are numbers. But what are we actually trying to do uh, on a daily basis in our daily practices? Well, we're trying to get the patient back in to preoperative function, despite the injury that we're causing with our operation. We're usually battling the gastrointestinal tract, get the, the gut uh, to move and have normal food intake, pain control and oral analgesics, and get the patient mobile again. And we want to avoid complications. So how did we learn, or I learn, how to uh, address those issues? Well, I was taught to do open surgery with large incisions, certainly nothing per os so from midnight and for a long time postoperatively until the gut started moving and we were giving a lot of IV fluids during surgery. So in essence, what were we actually up to? Stressing, starving, and drowning our patients. So how, did, how do we address that nowadays? Well, we're trying to enhance recovery through completely different means. We're addressing it the multimodal way that Henry Kellett showed us, uh, and we're using the evidence that's out there to get perioperative care to improve. But very importantly, this is not a dogma of a protocol that we have today, because today's program is going to be different tomorrow. So it's a, it's a new way of working to make sure that we can continuously put new things into place once we've proven their efficacy. So a little bit about the history. Probably the very first fast track uh, paper that was ever, ever published was from the US in coronary bypass. Bottom line is that they clearly did something with a multimodal approach to reduce the weight gain of these patients. So they managed some fluid balance improvements. And they got shorter ICU and shorter hospital stay. That is, is not a randomized trial. It was consecutive patients, but they clearly had something going. And then Henry Kellett did his work, and then Ken and I got together in 2001 through the big nutrition society in Europe, ESPEN. I had been working on insulin resistance and preoperative carbohydrates as a metabolic starting point. And, and Ken is really one of the, the world top-notch people in cancer cachexia. By the way, he's probably one of the few surgeons that have published regularly in, in journals like Nature alongside uh, the, the big uh, surgical and anesthesia journals. Fantastic guy. So we got together. We uh, brought in some friends that we had, Henry Kellett uh, and uh, Arthur Rebhag from Tromsø and, and Martin Mainfeld and Keith de Jong from Maastricht. So we all got together and said, okay, let's, let's review the entire process. We'll, we'll use Henrik's 
sort of protocol as the basis, and then we'll review all the literature that we can find. And then we start to compare with, once we had that outlined, we start to compare with our own practices and found, whoa, we're not aligned at all, and we're doing very, very differently, and certainly we're not following what, would, what we found was to be the best practice. And we decided to move everybody to what we called, we started to call ERAS care. And in doing so, we decided also to audit the process and you know, set definitions for uh, the uh, uh, comorbidities and the def you know, definitions for complications and all that stuff so we could really compare. And that was really the first step to uh, our audit system that we've developed later. And then once we had the data from what we were actually doing, the next surprise came. And that's the big one, actually. It wasn't at all the way we thought it was. We, were, we would have been targeting completely the wrong things if we did not uh, have the data there. For instance, in my institution, I had come up with the idea of carbohydrate loading. We were the worst to perform it because I had an anesthesiologist who just didn't like it. Okay? So that's, that's reality for you. So we understood if we're going to make changes appropriately, we have to have the data to help us drive the process. We put together this consensus guideline, came out in 2005, and it contained a whole range of different things that were, um, um, that were uh, we felt we had sufficient evidence to, to say that we would recommend one or the other. And then we started to uh, see if we could implement this. And we, it was the Dutch team that led the way with uh, uh, some experts in change management. They used a breakthrough methodology and studied three consecutive groups of, of hospitals, about 10 of them in each. And I'll just show you the bottom line of what they found. It was a reduction in length of stay for colonic resections in all three groups, very clearly so, as their compliance with the protocol that we had pr uh, proposed increased from 44 to 75%. So that was very encouraging. And uh, at that time, we'd done several publications and, uh, and uh, looked at various things. And we were sort of at a turning point. Were we going to continue to just do research, or were we going to actually try to move this implementation thing forward? And we decided for the latter. So we started uh, a formal society, and not just a study group, uh, a nonprofit, multi professional, multidisciplinary. Those two words are extremely important and a medical society. Um, and uh, the, the mission was to develop uh, and improve recovery through research education, but also help people to, to implement evidence-based care. So this is our website, and now we're really looking at our ultimate goal is to put in place in every healthcare unit, or as many as we can reach, a unit that is there to maintain good quality, but also be ready to make the next change, because they're coming all the time, and we're just too slow to make them uh, work in our own units. So a little bit about the philosophy. Well, hospital organization is really like silos, uh, and we all work in our own department, and if we look at it from a more structural point of view, uh, you know, we have all these different departments or uh, wards or parts of department where we spend all of our time. And we really don't move around between these different departments, so we have no clue what is happening in the next phase that the patient is coming to. Uh, and the only way that we're going to get to a, a, a really good outcome with all of this is if we have put together an integrated program that will be optimal for the patient all the way through, not just for the short period of time that I have the patient under my control. That may be actually very bad for the next one taking over. We talked a lot about fluids in this uh, conference, and, uh, and overloading of fluids might be great to manage uh, uh, you know, a good way for you where you feel safe to manage your, your uh, blood pressure hemodynamics during surgery, but it's going to cause ileus later down, down, down the line for those who are taking over the patient in the ward, just as one example. Now, we had in 2005, this was all the changes that we needed to do for the different professions. And, uh, and, of course, they were drastic changes compared to what, what I had been taught and what most of us had been taught in my generation. Um, and if you combine those two, obviously it gets even more complex. You, you know, all these different things are going to happen and be taken care of by different people all the way through. So it's all about integrating all of that care. That's really the, the, the key aspect of all of this.
Okay, nice idea. Now this was the introduction. Now I'm going to talk about how this may work. That's the metabolic part of it, okay? Uh, so, and again, it's a very, um, uh, uh, it's my personal view and uh, it's based on work that we've been doing over the years. Um, so we're going to address, uh, you know, the improvement and try to make the improvement with a multimodal approach to reduce the stress and actually support the function of, uh, that we're uh, trying to go for, you know, have the patient mobilized and all these different things that we mentioned early on. So the theory here, I'll just take you to start with a textbook slide, just to remind ourselves that we do have the injury here that we're causing, releasing all these stress hormones and the immune system to cause a, a marked change, very rapid change into a catabolic state. Now those two main features actually play an, a very important role. And the one that I've been focusing on in, 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 in my research group and with my colleagues has been the development of insulin resistance and how that could actually be playing a part in all of this. And we do believe that it, it is a central part of it. So I'll take you through that. Why, why insulin? Why is that so important? Well, you know, it's, it's, I think it's obvious in a way that this is our main anabolic hormone that is involved not only in glucose metabolism, although that's where the focus has been for the most part, but it also regulates fat metabolism and protein metabolism. And we'll do everything at the same time, actually. So it's a really also a regulator of some of the key functions that we're looking at. I mean, how are you going to feed the patient uh, postoperatively if they're diabetic and you don't manage their insulin function? Just as a very simple example. It's also central to the development of complications and there's been years of discussion still ongoing about hyperglycemia and glucose regulation, again insulin. The nice thing about it is that many of the treatments that we can choose to install to enhance recovery actually uh, uh, affect insulin function and the stress response. So just to give you a feel for uh, what we're talking about, and again, you have to measure insulin sensitivity the right way in order to, to actually uh, capture the problem. Uh, and we, you use a special, special method that takes about half day. Uh, it's called hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. I won't have time to go through it, but it's the, the matter of the fact that it's a bit time consuming is, is a point here. Anyway. Um, so you measure the relative change in insulin sensitivity simply because among our patients there's about a seven to eight fold variation in non-diabetic uh, individuals, okay? So the relative change, as you can see here on this slide, is very, um, is very similar after a given type of operation. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy, open hernia, open cholecystectomy, and open colorectal. So the greater the injury or the stress of, or the operation itself, uh, you know, the, the, the more resistant the patient is going to be. So if down here, they're losing about 70% of their insulin sensitivity, actually, which is a lot and very fast. It also shows you right off the bat the importance of choosing your surgical technique. You can minimize it a lot by just choosing minimal invasive surgery. Uh, the other thing that we were asked a long time ago was whether does it make a difference? So one of the ways that we could answer that is to uh, simply look at outcomes and look at factors that may uh, come to play here. And what we did when we looked at a material of well over 100 patients was that we could identify three independent factors that uh, contributed to the variation in length of stay in this case. It was the type of surgery perioperative blood loss, none of those big surprises, I think, but actually separate and independent of those two was the degree of insulin resistance. And those three together actually helped explain about 70% of the variation. So we, we thought it might actually have a role there. So what, what are we actually talking about as far as glucose metabolism? What, what's happening to the patients? Well, this is a slide that summarizes some of the key features of what we got. Obviously, there's hyperglycemia because of that reduction in insulin sensitivity, uh, increasing glucose production, but the predominant problem here is actually peripheral glucose uptake. Glu uh, insulin is simply not able to push in glucose in a normal way. And that is because it doesn't activate specific glucose transporters uh, in insulin sensitive cells. And there's also a reduction in glycogen formation. And all of those 
come to play actually when we discuss why this may be clinically relevant. You can see there's also a, 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 a panel there for type 2 diabetes and it's very, very similar actually. So in essence we have patients who are perfectly metabolically normal before the operation come out as untreated diabetics if you like. And of course that should make a bit of a difference. So let's just spend a little bit of time on glucose uptake and I've made some poor cartoons, you have to excuse me for them, but it's, anyway, uh, we, t we tend to uh, uh, think of glucose uptake as insulin regulated. Well, that, that is ac absolutely very true for muscle and for fat, but there's a whole range of other organs that take up glucose uh, regulated by the concentration in the bloodstream. And those are, you know, for example, kidney is dominated by this, blood cells, endothelial cells, and neural cells. Now, as soon as we have a meal, glucose levels comes up, insulin is activated. Well, this is probably what's the case in it for everybody who had breakfast right now. Uh, and that will push that glu uh, glucose into muscle and to, to fat. And because of uh, the transient increase in glucose in the, in, the, um, uh, in, in the bloodstream, we will have some increase, transient increase in all these other cells as well. So what happens during stress? Well, then we have a situation where that insulin function is shut down, and we also have more uh, glucose release, actually, from the, from the um, liver. And we get very high glucose levels. And now, all of a sudden, we have a lot of inflow to all of these different cells. And that may help explain, or at least from a theoretical point of view, um, points in a direction to it may help us explain why we have some complications. So basically, in stress, we have a situation with too much on the one hand and too little on the other hand. And let's see how that comes to play. We'll start with too little. Well, we know we have uh, muscle weakness postoperatively, and it stays there for a long time. And that may be explained simply by the reduced glucose uptake, less energy, and, and the glycogen storage is also down. And at the same time, we have, because of that insulin faulting uh, action, an increased protein catabolism. So obviously, energy supply is going to be down. Lean body mass is dropping. We know that from several studies. Muscle function goes down, and mobilization is going to be harder. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so let's um, look at another insulin sensitive organ that is also activated. This is just some, some data we produced a few years ago. Again, we have this insulin uptake pathway being blocked on the insulin signaling pathway uh, and blocking glucose uptake. But at the same time, and this is very interesting, I think, we have an activation of the inflammatory systems of fat cells that will help contribute to that overall inflammation. So there's another very interesting research topic uh, ongoing. So what about the other side of things? Too much inflow into these cells. So let's just uh, dice. That, that may actually help explain, potentially, some of the problems we're facing. Infections, cardiovascular, renal, well, it's, it's all those cells, right? So they're certainly involved to some extent. And why, why could that be? What, what's happening there? Well, we've looked into the diabetic literature, and there's some um, people like uh, uh, Brownlee from Harvard uh, or Boston who has done some phenomenal work in this, and really, uh, a lot of that then shows up also in surgical patients. Uh, there's an uncontrolled inflow of glucose to these cells because there's really nothing to stop them, if you like. You know, the concentration's up, that just floods them in. They don't have any storage capacity. There's no glycogen in most of these cells, right? So they, the only way that glucose can go is through glycolysis. And eventually, that will cause uh, an overloading of the, the uh, respiratory systems and cause uh, uh, production of ad uh, oxygen-free radicals, which in turn will make a block of the glycolysis upstream just to try to protect itself. And then all of a sudden, you have a, a complete diversion of your whole metabolism, and that will affect uh, gene expression. Very complicated stuff, but it's quite interesting when you start to dissect what is actually happening, because in the end, this actually transforms into an enhancement of the inflammatory response again. So, uh, very interesting theories around that. So let's just go to some data. 
I think right now one of the most I interesting things is actually where, uh, when discussing glucose levels and where diabetics should be with glucose levels is probably to maintain where they were before they come to the operation. But I I'm just going to show you some of the data now on um, what we're seeing in colorectal surgery in, in some of the more recent literature. Well, this is just a, a study where they looked at glucose levels uh, in a cohort of 2,600 patients, both diabetics and predominantly non-diabetics. And they checked different levels of peak glucose levels early on postoperatively and subsequent development of uh, complications. And what they found is basically this. They, they had uh, you know, normal glycemic, mild glycemia, and severe glycemia, and with greater peak levels, there was a greater risk of developing a whole range of complications. You won't be able to read all of those, but it's basically all the, the regular complications that we see, a lot of the more common ones. And uh, incidentally, that also transformed into uh, a greater risk with, for reoperations and a longer length of stay. So an indicator that perhaps you know, this disturbance is involved in the development. It's not a proof for it, but it certainly, certainly is, is interesting in itself. Now, we, we did a study in our own unit with uh, Ulf Gustafsson published this a few years ago, where we looked at our cancer patients coming in for colorectal surgery, uh, about 120 consecutive ones. We knew that cancer would uh, cause a disturbance in glucose metabolism as well, so we checked HbA1c on all of our patients that were uh, without a diagnosis of any kind of diabetes. And we found that actually 25% of them, roughly, uh, actually had an elevation of HbA1c. And then we followed their glucose levels five times a day throughout the first uh, few days postoperatively. Uh, and these guys were eating, by the way. They were consuming 1,500 calories, uh, normal food uh, and some supplements, on an average from day one, because they were on this enhanced recovery program. And, but what you can see is that those that were, uh, had a higher HbA1c to begin with stayed about one millimole higher all the way through postoperatively. And this in turn was uh, uh, actually um, associated with complications as you can see here. So, and that was dominated by infections. So again, uh, I think there's a, a, an interesting association. Now, there's a group in Canada that have done a, 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 a absolutely heroic work looking at insulin resistance, specifically not glucose levels, but insulin resistance and what that does for, uh, for a later outcome if it's involved at all. And they, they did these uh, studies on the, uh, during the operation actually, which is in itself very tricky. Uh, but uh, they did it in almost 300 patients, which is a, a, an amazing thing to do actually. But what they showed that was with every 25% reduction in insulin sensitivity when the patient was leaving the operating table, because that's when they had the measure, they had a, an increasing risk of complications in the next 30 days. So you can see a major complications for every 25% uh, reduction in insulin sensitivity, a two, more than a two-fold risk of the increase almost a five-fold increase for severe infection and also for minor infection. And incidentally, it was borderline significant for, for actually dying within uh, 30 days. So uh, there, there seems to be something strong in here, actually. So if we just take a look at um, all of these different elements that we looked at, which ones would be involved in, in insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance? Well, Actually, very many of them, directly or indirectly. Uh, I, I'm not going to take you through all of them, I promise you, uh, but uh, I'll take you through a few of them and just to show you how you can use that multimodal approach to actually achieve uh, quite a market change in, in your um, postoperative metabolism in these patients. So first of all, um, one of my favorites, obviously, is, is the change of metabolism before the operation, avoiding that nothing per os from midnight, and rather give carbohydrates. And in fact, this knowledge has now spread very far. So I'm going to show you a video, and in case you, your English is poor, I actually put some Swedish subtitles in there as well for you. No, got a dental appointment. Oh, what, Tim Watley? Yeah, 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 I got to check up Thursday. Yeah, how do you like that? You know, you really shouldn't brush 24 hours before seeing the dentist. 
I think that's eat 24 hours before surgery. Oh, no, you gotta eat before surgery. You need your strength. So, you know, even Kramer knows it now. So, actually, if you go down the path of history and look at the evidence behind that, reg that rule, which is probably, by the way, the best known medical rule in the world, you are not allowed to eat or drink anything after midnight because if you do, you will die on the table, right? Everybody knows that. There was never ev any evidence. It's true. There's never, ever any scientific evidence for its, uh, you know, its use. So every evidence actually shows the other, uh, the other direction. It, it was written in a textbook and then somebody just did that and then copied by everybody else. Isn't that interesting? Okay, anyway, what do we do with the carbohydrate treatment? Well, we change metabolism from, and I'm using this graph again, from a fasted state uh, where there's no activity of insulin to about a 50% boost of its, of its uh, um, action and activate all these systems that actually promote glucose uptake, storage, and so forth into the muscle. Uh, and that actually carries through to the postoperative phase. So here's a, a range of different operations, cholecystectomy, colorectal, and so forth, that have been carbohydrate loaded. You can see about a 50% reduction in most of these studies in the postoperative insulin resistance. So you can actually gain something as you do that. The other thing which is interesting, and this is studies from Japan, where they, uh, uh, or China actually, uh, where they looked at some of the um, signaling pathways in muscle uh, in patients that were carbohydrate loaded or not. And you can see here that PI3 kinase, which is one of the key signals to activate that glucose uptake mechanism, is much higher in the, at the end of surgery uh, in the patients given carbohydrates. What is also interesting is that the same phenomenon occurs for protein tyrosine kinase activity, which is the signal that is key for protein anabolism in muscle. And that may actually help explain why uh, there's a retainment of lean body mass postoperatively with this very simple treatment, as shown from this Scottish study some years ago. Or uh, potentially also why muscle strength might be there, actually f f pretty far down the line, uh, a month after the operation, a Danish study showing that. And in, incidentally, in this, in this study here, they showed that the glycogen synthase activity that regulates glycogen storage was much higher in the group that had the carbohydrates one month after the operation. So there's something that lingers on for quite some time postoperatively that seemed to be meaningful. Now, uh, other people have reviewed the literature, uh, such as the group of anesthesiologists in Europe, and they now recommend this carbohydrate treatment at a, at a, at a reasonably high level. Uh, because of its properties in, in improving well-being and insulin resistance. Uh, and they were asking for data on postoperative stay and mortality. Uh, mortality, I, th I don't think, will ever uh, improve with this simple treatment, but there is some data to suggest, at least, that uh, uh, there may be something in the recovery, and perhaps what I've just told you could help explain that. Um, and this is the Cochrane analysis showing that there uh, might be a, a shortening of length of stay for major abdominal surgery anyway, where the most data is. Now, the, the, these studies are fairly small. They're heterogeneous, so they have a lot of some, some of these flaws that we're, that we're often facing when we're putting together our evidence, but nevertheless. There's also some studies indicating that it may help the cardiac muscle, and this is a, a randomized trial from uh, Germany where they showed that actually there was a less need for inotropic support with carbohydrate treatment before the operation. Now another way to address it, apart from carbohydrates, completely different mechanism to address that insulin resistance is to put that thoracic epidural uh, in place and activate it before the operation because that will help block the release of two of the key stress hormones, epinephrine and cortisol. And that actually has a, a dramatic effect again on insulin resistance postoperatively, about a 40-45% reduction in itself. And then you can combine these two, obviously, and you can add another one, which is enteral feeding immediately after the operation. This is what Matthias Soup did, one of my former students, and uh, he combined those three in major colorectal surgery. 
So these patients were given enteral feeds at a standard high rate immediately after the operation, and he checked those blood sugars all the way through. And uh, he did a few more uh, things along this study as well. But he had a control group with hypercaloric glucose. But what you can see here is the blue line is the important one, that with these elements in place, without any insulin given after this big open surgery, there was no hyperglycemia. And incidentally, there's, this is a, a reference from the literature where they did the same study, basically, but without the carbohydrates, without the epidural, and their glucose level was much higher. So what's behind this? Well, he measured, he measured the um, insulin sensitivity as well, and he, he found that he could, with these three elements, he raised it up to a level of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Now, let's just reflect on that for a moment. We go to see our patients and we think of them as somebody who's been through a huge operation, and that might be true. But if we look at them as somebody who is at the stress level of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, they should be able to mobilize, they should be able to eat and move around, right? So that's the perception that we, we have to move to as we're moving into enhanced recovery uh, and, and trying to, to improve things for our patients. So let me just uh, take you through a journey uh, with the, for the, that the patient makes in traditional care and enhanced recovery care and use insulin sensitivity as the marker of the change, okay? So this is a cartoon that I put together. So here we have the normal level. These uh, traditional patients would have a bowel prep and certainly no nutrition after that. So they won't be eating anything from lunchtime at, the, at best. Uh, and that would certainly bring down their insulin sensitivity, whereas these guys will have a normal dinner, a normal sleep, that will take them down a little bit. We'll then give them, our ERAS patients, a carbohydrate boost. We'll bring them up 50%, which is what we do normally every day. The other guys would be overnight fasted, obviously. We would place that epidural instead of giving the preoperative sedation to the patients. We would activate it, and because of that activation, the drop is going to be half as much as we have uh, without that epidural. This is open surgery, by the way. And of course, post-operatively, we, we get the patients up and we start feeding them immediately. That, again, stimulates insulin sensitivity and brings them on an uphill uh, slide rather than starving them or semi-starving them with a 5% glucose infusion and wait until their bowels move days later. And of course, being down here is gonna take much longer to get back up again compared to if you're almost there to begin with a couple of days post-operatively. So that, I think, really illustrates the difference between the two from a stress point of view. And there you have why we have those two arrows on our logo, actually. I think the next step in all of this is going to be prehabilitation, which is really helping people to move up the scale and get in better shape, metabolically and more physically fit, before the operation so that the dip after the surgery is going to be at a, a, a better level again. Won't go into that anymore. But another thing is also developing, and talking about glucose metabolism, insulin, and so forth, when you're introducing all this stress-free surgery, again, you're going to change uh, the reality out there. And this is Henry Kellett's work from uh, his hip and knee replacement patients, and he looked at different levels of diabetes, insulin, oral, uh, oral medication, and just diet. And he looked at the outcomes for these patients, and he found that actually for all the patients except those that were diabetic uh, with insulin, there was no increased risk for any complications. So, you know, that stress reduction really makes a difference for this as well. Well, I was involved a little bit with this Polish group where they looked at outcomes after colorectal surgery with a proper ERAS program running and laparoscopic surgery. What are the determinants for, for a length of stay and complications? None of the comorbidities showed up anymore. It was all about compliance with the protocol if we were treating the patients the best way or not, which is again another sign that we have a lot more in our hands than we think we do. And we're, whilst we're talking about outcomes, what is fascinating field of research is really uh, long-term outcomes after cancer surgery. That's something that is, I think, extremely interesting. And this is from a review that I found um, 
not too long ago and just start looking at what are the factors that we can affect with our perioperative care elements that we're introducing. And there's actually a whole range of them that may work in a positive way for long-term cancer outcomes. And incidentally, I'll show you a little bit later, there are data to suggest that actually if you do introduce enhanced recovery, you get some really, really good results. Okay, so that was all theory. Now the question is, does it work? Well, I think the thing that really actually made a big breakthrough was the fact that data was beginning to show up that we could, uh, with this kind of approach, reduce not only length of stay, but also complications. And I think this was the first paper that came out. And it was later confirmed with uh, updated meta-analysis. This is from 14, showing a remarkable reduction, actually, in complications, 40% down. That is, is big. And it was mainly the non-surgical complications, which makes perfect sense if you think of the theories behind it. It's the organs that would uh, suffer the most stress, that are most vulnerable, that would also have the best benefit. But uh, I think we're going to see very soon that also surgical complications are going to be proved to be uh, 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 benefiting from this. That is important because, and this is a slide that's been shown several times, if you have a complication, big material from the US showing that if you, if you don't have a complication, your life expectancy will be this after a surgery. If you do have a complication, it's gonna be much worse off. And it's not that you're dying within the first 30 days because if you exclude those patients, you still have pretty much the same difference. So complications is much worse than we think they are actually. The other thing is cost savings and that's the world we're living in. We just have to accept it. New Zealand, Switzerland, Canada, single units all showing already when, you know, within the first year, marked savings uh, per patient doing this. And in fact, if you go to a whole system, like in Alberta Healthcare in Canada, they're also saving uh, a lot of money on a systems level, and that's why they're rolling it out all over the state. And this is again from the, a, a national feature from the UK. They did a, a, a long program with uh, Martin Kruger and, uh, and Mike Scott, there's two people here actually very much involved in that, very successful reducing length of stay. Uh, and this is just one of the many operations that they were addressing. Well, great results. Why isn't everybody using this? Well, I do a little quiz. Uh, and sometimes when I give lectures, maybe we can do it here again. So can I just have a raise of hands? Who's aware of ERAS? Yeah, that's what usually what we get. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just have the next question. Who has an ERAS protocol? Yeah? Okay, that's what we've been seeing lately at the World Congress of Anesthesia as well and with Surgeon. So last question, who uh, could provide data on compliance with that protocol? Yeah, I see three, four hands, yeah. Okay, this is where I think you need to go, actually. So the rest of my talk will be a little bit about how we address these issues and actually put that knowledge and the ideas that we have, the information that's out there, how do we, what we put it in. But before we do that, this is another issue that I think, uh, at least I'm facing very much in Sweden. We do it already, don't worry, you know, no problem. But the nice thing, funny thing about that is that the national length of stay, I showed you before, is, is very long. And in fact, we trained about half the units and their length of stay is like this. So everybody who's telling me that they're doing it, they're not, clearly. And their length of stay is much higher than they think. So they're doing bits and pieces and think they actually have the whole package. So I think it's time for ERAS 2.0 for everybody who's, who thinks they're actually into it and don't have full control of their data. So I think actually we're very early in, our, in where we are. And one of the reasons for this is that we need to have better uh, audit systems. And this is a, a study that I learned about for several years ago where they checked the German uh, I, uh, intensivists with a quiz or a, a, um, they did a survey. And they asked them if they were using low tidal volume ventilations in their ICUs. And 92% did because they knew, you know, clearly it reduces uh, uh, mortality. But the authors then went around and checked the settings of all these uh, uh, ventilators and this is what they found. So that, that's frightening, isn't it? One, one single element in one unit, very clear benefits.
uh, tells us they knew what they were supposed to do. Uh, they thought it was being done, but in fact they had no clue. We're not very good at auditing, actually. And if we take uh, just enhanced recovery, we have a whole range of different things that is going to happen to the patient in different places and so forth. How are we going to manage all of that? Well, we need to audit in a very specific way. And that's something that we've been taking on in the society. And uh, we've also built from the uh, learnings we had with the Dutch team to build an implementation program with some building blocks. So first of all, the guidelines. So many of you hopefully have seen this. If you haven't, please go to our website and check out the guidelines. We have all these in red uh, are out there. Uh, these are coming very soon, and the ones in blue are under production. And they're all available at our website, so free, free downloads, okay? We also update them on a regular basis because we need to do that, and in fact, we probably should do it even sooner than this uh, with the shorter intervals. And the, the other thing that we've done is we've tested them. And this is from my own unit where we looked at compliance from 50%, 70 80 and 90%. You can see here open surgery, how length of stay comes down, as do readmissions. Uh, now, this was uh, a good news for the management because it was saving money. But the important thing for the patients, again, complications coming down very drastically. So that was good for a single unit. We then went to the database that we have, several, you know, uh, that we have on board for many units, 13 hospitals in seven countries, bigger material, same thing for all complications, but now we're able to show that even the, the, the major complications that we fear the most also were significantly affected uh, in, in, in a strong association. And incidentally, we went back to our own data five years down the line and looked at what happened to these cancer patients. And we, we, we were able to show an association with compliance less than 70 percent, where that was the cutoff actually, and that divided the line of, of, for survival five years down the line. Uh, and uh, that's actually not the only one that's out there. There was one already in orthopedic surgery when they moved from traditional care to, um, to enhanced recovery. And they could show two years down the line that there seemed to be a, a, an association with better uh, survival, actually. Uh, I won't go into the details of that, but again, it has to do with the long-term cancer outcomes that we touched on before. So the implementation program is based on structured training uh, and we train teams, very important. It's not a single surgeon who comes around, it's a team of surgeon, anesthetist and a, and a nurse. That's the absolute basis and we'd like to have physios and, and others involved as well. Ward nurses, uh, dietitians, and we want the management to sign up so that they have uh, secure the time these guys do everything, actually, this team. And this is the core of keeping a good system in place later on as well. So this is the new way of working. And that way, whatever question comes up, there's uh, always somebody around the table that will, can take responsibility for it. And, of course, with every new thing that comes in as well, there's somebody who can lead that work. We run it through four uh, interactive workshops over about eight to ten months with coaching in between. We have several teams come together for all these workshops to stimulate each other for better results. And uh, actually we set up in different countries centers of excellence that run symposia and then invite people to these implementation programs. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, that's really the, the, the project that we're running. And on, as part of this we have developed what we call interactive audit system. And I'll, I'll just touch on that. The idea is to help people not spend a lot of time on uh, building their own Excel program and do their own audit, which is, you know, could be a good start, but we would gain so much more if we were uh, adopting the methodology that some of these guys have done, get a lot of people on the system and help them make the changes much quicker. I'm sure most of us within the last month have changed our operating system or updated an app. I mean, they, they, they have us do this at a whim, and, and whereas we take 15 years to change practice, so we have something to learn there. So if we can get many on one system, there will be many advantages the way we look at it. Uh, it could be, you know, it works as an implementation tool, quality registry, but importantly also a research tool and an updating tool. So I'll just, just take you through that, in, in, and it's, so it's one system, and uh, uh, it's based on the guidelines, so there's an update all the time. 
Uh, it's all the security issues that you may want and de-identified patient data, ownership by the entering unit and national and regional control. So let's go through this. Um, uh, it's actually, when you look at quality systems are, are actually unusual uh, if you look at uh, around, the, uh, around the world. There's only a few countries that have it really embedded. But the, the important thing for initiating this is the implementation tool. So this is the, what it looks like. You have uh, the patient's journey here. You fill in and tab yourself through uh, different pages and fill in the data. Uh, there are definitions with, uh, with help text everywhere. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes to fill it in. And then you can have a dashboard with your results. So you can see your length of stay, your main problems that, you're, uh, that the patients had, the operations that were made, and this is a compliance curve over time. And you can see it jumps there a little bit. So if we just go back in time to, to this period, when they were in put in their first 50 patients as we do during the training program, they could see what they're actually doing for the first time. And it looked like this. So you can see there were several elements that they were not performing at all, that they actually thought they were doing, many of them. And we then helped them change these things and they get that at a whim. So they, it's, it's available anytime for review and you can, you can check it. The other thing that it can be used for is to address a specific problem. So, for instance, this group had uh, PONV as their most delicate problem. So they click on that bar and then they select only the patients that have that specific problem. And they could immediately see that that prolonged length of stay by two days. But they can also see what they actually did with these patients and again find the reasons behind it. And as you can see, already on the first part of the journey for the patient, there are four elements that very well could have contributed. And if you go further down in the patient's journey, even more. So a lot of different things probably contributed to why these patients had that problem. Now, it may look very, very difficult to address that, but in fact, we've, uh, because the, you know, all these things are happening in different places, so many people involved. But in fact, if you have a system installed where you can show everybody what they're actually doing in the contributing to improve that, by giving them the curve of their performance alongside everybody else's performance as you initiate that project, you actually get that stimulation for change that you need. And of course, you show the results at the same time. Now, you, you, we actually use the fact that all of us initially started medicine to help people, and that's the same with everybody on board. So if you could just help them see what they can do to actually do, to get to that point and do it better, they're very keen to get it done, actually. So this is what we're finding. In Sweden, we had a, not such a great uh, improvement in our compliance, but we certainly changed the right things. It was a lot of fluid management, and we could see how that length of stay came down. In the USA, uh, they were doing uh, quite well. They had uh, th five days, but we, they came down to three days in, in this group. In a developing country, it may look like this low, very low compliance to begin with, we get them up to about 60, 70, and all of a sudden you have that drop in length of stay again. Now, the other thing that I'd like to spend a, a minute on is how important this could be as a research tool, and this is something where we're focusing very hard right now. Now, the whole system was actually tailored for, for research uh, initially. We were all academics that started this whole thing, so we can do audit research, but we can also do randomized controlled trials in the system. That means that we actually do a randomized trial in a quality registry. So we can check the hypothesis as we normally do inside the study, but we can also check for many of the questions that we're asking outside the system, outside the study. And that means that we could get a much broader answer whether it's working or not. The other thing that we are getting all the time is control over all the variables that have been identified uh, to make a difference for the outcome. So we can control for that. We can have it in a calculation. We don't do that today. And of course, we have insights to the variation between different centers, so we can pick and find the right centers for the right study. And of course, within the society, we have very strong and continuously growing strength of academic leadership in the system. So this is how we're hoping to engage more and more of those who are interested in helping us in that way. So our goal is to get faster generation of knowledge this way.
And then, of course, we can use it as an updating system. Everybody who's on board on the system would get, uh, you know, once the data is proven to be uh, good enough, we will have it for review in the guideline group and then put it into uh, our guidelines and then in the system, and then it's ready. We have the team ready to make that next change. So just to summarize in the last few minutes, best practice is clearly not in use. It is a very complex but certainly extremely important part of our treatment, uh, the perioperative care. Multiprofessional, multidisciplinary, I think is an absolutely necessary approach. We find that it's systemic, uh, systematic implementation in teams really helps, and if we can help people see what they're doing, that helps also. We know that ERAS improves outcomes, and it's not just for today, it's for tomorrow as well. We all win from this. Our patients first and foremost, obviously, that's why we're all here, but also we're finding that staff feel more secure in what they're doing with these protocols in place, and down the line, we're all payers one way or another, so we should do what we can to save that cost as well. But down the line, the mission that we're taking on that we seek uh, more engagement is, is to help everybody make change the routine. So coming back to where I started, <clears throat> growing an aging population, pressure for better results, diminishing funding, better care for less cost fast. I think we can do that, actually. I think we can do all of that, and we can, we can get that going. So we, we just started this movement. It is what David said, it is a movement more than anything else. We founded the society in 2010. 2012, we had our first uh, Congress. It's a multidisciplinary Congress. We all sit in the same room all the way through. For, I, I think you understand why now. In 2014, it was growing even further. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like today. So it's virtually exploding. All the red ones are uh, units that we're training to then help train others. And all the black ones is where we're uh, uh, having discussions for next phases. So the metabolic journey. Well, it started really with Ken and I deciding at a bar to get nutrition and metabolism back on the surgical agenda. That was actually the words that we said. And uh, we, uh, we've been pleased to find that actually at least contributing to this, is managing the metabolic responses is a, is a, a part of the effect. And, and it, it impacts well-being, function, and outcomes. And we've been finding that the most rewarding of all of this is actually seeing that we can together uh, move evidence into practice. It is extremely rewarding, I can assure you. So please uh, visit us at our website, and even better, come to Lyon next year and join the group and, uh, and uh, visit us at our conference. Thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you very much, Oli, for a, 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 very, a most interesting, informing, challenging, I think, for us to maintain the, the passion uh, in this very important area. So thank you very much for that. The, the uh, organizers have a gift for you, uh, which is Melbourne Monopoly. So I understand your wife has just joined you today. If it rains, uh, you've got something to do. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I must say uh, that uh, Simon Riley and Colin Royce have put together an excellent program uh, and to continue the plenary session now I would like to hand over the chairmanship to the current president of the ASA, Dr Guy Christie Taylor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed and, and welcome. We're going to change uh, tack ever so slightly, and it's my great uh, pleasure to host this particular plenary. Uh, by way of introduction, I thought I should draw uh, your attention to the fact that uh, the American Society of Anesthesiologists have just recently launched a new uh, ASA patient safety initiative uh, under the chairmanship of Lee Fleischer, which I think is relevant for this session, and that's entitled the Brain Health Initiative, and this was launched and began in August, um, and it's in its, in its infancy. And I guess just um, by way of introduction, they say, as physician anesthesiologists, we are well aware of the important concerns of patients and their families 
in that they or their parents or grandparents are frequently not the same from a neurologic or psychological point of view, either immediately or for prolonged periods after surgery. So by way of lead-in, that allows me to introduce to you um, Professor Stanton Newman. Um, Professor Newman is the Professor of Health Psychology and Dean of the School of Health Sciences at the City University of London. He's published over 350 research papers and chapters as well as 18 books. And one of his areas of specialization is the impact of surgery and anesthesia on the brain. Uh, he's developed tools to assess cognition before and after surgery and anesthesia and examined the methodological issues in establishing post-operative cognitive def deficits. So it gives me huge pleasure to invite Stanton up to give his address, which is aptly entitled Cognitive Recovery After Surgery, The Elephant in the Room. Thank you very much, Stanton. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to first of all thank Guy for that generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank Colin and Simon for the invitation. And I'd like to thank Melbourne for giving us pretty good weather until today. Uh, it's been a, a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to meet you all. It's always interesting being in an environment with anaesthetists and alternatively sometimes with surgeons. But I do like the fact that surgeons and anaesthetists get together. So when we first started working in this area, neither the surgeon nor the anaesthetist nor the ICU post-operative people felt that cognition was their, their problem. And we decided to cause post-operative cognitive deficits. We termed it the elevator problem, because clearly the problem happened as the patient was wheeled out of surgery up in the elevator into the ICU. So let me take you through the story, and I just want to go through what I plan to talk about. And this is going to be a very much a, a quick tour around the area. I want to talk about assessing outcomes in surgery in general. And I want to take you through the key outcomes that one normally looks at. Then I want to talk about cognition. I'm going to separate out cardiac and non-cardiac surgery. Uh, I want to look at, in particular, where the field is moving to look at individual differences in patients as they present for surgery. And I think it's important for us all to bear in mind the longer-term consequences of patients who demonstrate post-operative cognitive deficits. And let me say all scientific areas and all areas in, in every field are full of controversies and methodological issues. I can say this one specializes in methodological problems. Uh, I'm going to leave those till the end, but I think they're important to bear in mind as one tries to sift through a huge volume of literature in the area. Assessment of outcome in surgery always starts off with the key outcome, which revolves around whether the patient survives or not. And you can see this paper written some time ago, published in the Annals of Surgery in the 1930s. And it really became the purview of a pathologist to look at the causes of mortality after surgery. But I think we've moved on a lot from there. And if you have a look at surgical mortality now, this is a study by Burstock done a couple of years ago. He reviewed 32 studies of hip replacement. And the incidence of mortality in 30 days was 0.3. And if you have a look at the 90-day mortality, it was 0.65. And one of the reasons to illustrate this is the relative success that we've had in terms of survival after surgery over the years, and indeed how difficult it is to use mortality as an outcome measure in many areas. Even though we have increasingly comorbid patients, there still continues to be a general reduction in mortality rates. The risk factors for early mortality tend to be age. And age is going to be a recurring theme, something none of us can avoid. But one of the critical issues in terms of outcome from surgery and anesthesia, and in particular in relation to the brain. Cardiovascular complications appear to have overtaken the other complications that we tended to see as the leading cause of death, in this case, in terms of hip replacement. If you have now uh, have a look at cardiac bypass surgery, the mortality ranges between 0 to 4 percent, and the one-year mortality is about 6.2 percent, according to the study in 2014. 
We turn now to another kind of outcome, absolutely devastating for patients and their families. It is that of stroke. And you, this is a very big study, half a million patients, taking the American College of Surgeons Quality Improvement Program database and published in 2011. Looking at non-cardiac and non-neurological surgery, the risk of perioperative stroke was 0.1%. What's important again here are the risk factors associated with stroke following surgery. And I just draw your attention to the uppermost one again, which is age. You can see age is the most important predictor in terms of the likelihood of having stroke. And you can go down through the other ones uh, in terms of the, the nature of the problem. But age being a key risk factor in terms of the development of stroke. The 30-day stroke rate into cabbage is about 1.2%. Devastating impact on patients, relative success in terms of outcomes. If you have a look at MRI studies, I draw your attention to the MRI changes that people have detected from before to after surgery. This is a heroic study which would never pass any ethical uh, committee these days. But it did pass it, the study done by Harris at the Hammersmith Hospital wheeled patients out of, when they'd finished their coronary artery bypass graft uh, uh, and wheeled them directly into the MRI. I'm sure no institutional review board or ethical committee would ever pass this again. As you can see, he only survived to get six patients. But they all showed brain swelling immediately afterwards. But five had recovered in terms of the, uh, in the few days past surgery. I'm afraid those MRI scans don't look particularly attractive. We did some studies, uh, and uh, Dixon Moody at North Carolina did some studies in the early days in cardiac surgery looking at the incidence of new lesions following coronary artery bypass graft surgery and valves, and also Dixon looked at some pediatric surgery. And you can see with cabbage, the increased number of lesions is demonstrated on the MRI ranged between about 10 and 28%. Valve surgery produced greater changes in terms of the MRI detection of lesions, well, just slightly above 50%. And then the pediatric surgery showed some changes as well. Looking more recently to studies, this is a study uh, looking at 125 subjects, pre and post cabbage. And again, they found now 13.6% of patients showed new lesions on the diffusion weighted imaging. They located in the border zones between the vascular territories, and they tended to be small, but nonetheless clearly detectable after cardiac surgery. So overall, the patients receiving new ischemic lesions as demonstrated on the MRI in cabbage have ranged from about 31% to 51% and valves 32 to 47. And these lesions, because of their location, appear to be consistent with embolic or microembolic pathology. The relationship, as some have examined, in between MRI lesions and postoperative cognitive deficits has not been terribly good. And there are many explanations about why many studies haven't found this association. And I'll come on to some of those in a bit more detail. But the huge variability in neuropsychological testing is one issue, and the range and difference of MRI techniques, and indeed the methodological quality of the studies, in particular in relation to the number of subjects that they had in the study. And then there's a very important study done by Dixon Moody in uh, Wake Forest University looking at pathology, brain pathology in patients who passed away as well as dog studies, and he found these uh, particular scads, as he described them, using a particular histochemistry technique, and he found these in the, present in the brain of both dogs that had bypass and in post-mortems of people who had cabbage. Again, Dixon felt that this was consistent with an embolic pathology in that area. But as we'll see, this tends to be somewhat of a simplistic unifactorial explanation of what might, what might be going on in coronary bypass surgery. So I want to turn, we've moved from pathology, we've moved from death, we've moved from strokes, we've looked at pathology and we've looked at MRI scans. But what's pretty important to the patient is how well they can think 
whether they can go back to work, whether they have the cognitive capacity to do things that we do, they were doing before. I want to first of all distinguish again in this literature which is littered with all sorts of different terminological issues and distinguish between delirium, which I'm sure some of the delirium researchers won't feel this, but I think I can say that it's a relatively easily recognized acute condition and it has huge disturbances in attention, changes in level of, co of co consciousness, along with disorganized thinking. Cognitive disturbance tends to be something that's transient, happens in the short term, and tends to be apparent in the days after surgery. It does occur relatively frequently, and it's best assessed by formal neuropsychological testing or some form of screening test. Cognitive deficit, on the other hand, which is largely the subject of the talk today, is a persisting cognitive disturbance that lasts for weeks, months, and indeed years after surgery. It occurs significantly less frequently than cognitive disturbance, and again, best tested by formal cognitive or neuropsychological assessment. Now, I want to distinguish the cognitive deficit from post-operative cognitive complaints. Lots of patients complain of alterations in cognition after surgery. And if you look at the data on bypass surgery, for example, over a quarter of patients claim that their memory actually has deteriorated. The evidence suggests that these aren't the patients who will be detected on formal neuropsychological testing. They tend to be the patients who have higher levels of depressed mood and higher levels of anxiety. And it's the anxiety and the depressed mood that gets them to notice it. Because if I asked all of you today, how many of you have had a memory failure in the last 48 hours? Let me ask the question. How many of you have had a memory failure in the last 48 hours? So how many of you haven't had a memory failure in the last 48 hours? <laughs> Why that's an important question <clears throat> is if you're anxious about what's going on in your body, you notice the memory failure. I'm not suggesting the three quarters of the people who put their hands up but you really need to be careful about how one examines these issues. And it's a dilemma for me to say that because lots of the work that we began began with a very well-known banker in the city of London who was operated on by a colleague of mine, Tom Treasure. And Tom came to see me after he operated on the bank and he was a bit disturbed. He said, the banker came up to me and he said, I used to be able to do the Times crossword by the time I arrived at Bank Station in my train. Since you've improved my heart, and got me better again, I'm only halfway through it. Why is that? And that provoked some 25 years ago the establishment of the brain and surgery group at my institution and set us on a whole train of work. So I've been helped by subject of complaints in a number of ways. One, it provoked the study. Two, if patients could accurately report that they had cognition changes and it correlated with objective changes, there'd be no need for a neuropsychologist. Let me just take you through some neuropsychological tests to give you an idea. I won't subject you to, uh, to really stringent ones, but just to give you an idea about what happens. But to put it into perspective, they designed to measure objectively cognitive function. The test used to detection of POCD, unlike many that are employed in clinical practice, tend, must be sensitive to change. The one thing you know you will not find you won't find any POCD if you use tests that aren't sensitive to change. And some of the data actually did that. They need to be assessed, sensitive to diffuse cortical damage. And you need to select from a battery of tests, because as um, many people have said, the brain is your most complex organ. And the sense that you can assess all the functions of the brain very simply is quite tricky. You need to cover a range of different functions, ideally ones that are sensitive to diffuse cortical change. If you do a clinical neuropsychological assessment for clinical practice, it takes a minimum of two to three hours. Normally, the patient needs to return to look at the stability of performance. In surgery, the tests that we use take about 30 to 40 minutes. Now, there are a huge number of neuropsychological tests. Some are more simple than others, as you can see by that cartoon. Some of them are pretty obvious about people making interesting decisions in their lives. And indeed, anything is a cognitive test. But the formal cognitive tests 
that have been assessed for reliability, val validity, sensitivity to change vary. We did a review of POCD studies in non-cardiac surgery, and to my shame and concern, there were 70 different neuropsychological assessments used in the studies that we reviewed. And there were also nine composite batteries. And the number of tests used, which I'll come back to this issue in a while, ranged between one test and 13 tests. And that's one of the dilemmas in the field, is what you choose to assess the brain. Here's an example of a, of a test that we used. It's computerized. This is displayed permanently on the screen. And the subject is sat before a computer or a tablet which has digits on it. And they're required to type in the appropriate numbers under the appropriate figures as quickly and as accurately as they can. What's important here is you want to look at speed of performance. How quickly can people process information? What we found is people vary hugely when you try and assess their cognitive function, is if we put the number in, some people would be so careful and wanting to get it right, they'd go back and check and their time was hugely long. So we just blanked it out and used this. This is an adaptation of a paper and pencil test. This is a test used by the US Army, very widely used for the detection of, of um, cognitive function. Very simply, you get the patient to trace with a pencil sequentially A, B, C, D, E, F, and so on, and it's a time test and accuracy. More complex is the trail-making B test, where you go 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D, and that just shows you an example. Again, the speed with which you can process the information is important. This picks up visual attention, concentration in particular, as well as perceptual motor performance. And this is one for you to try. This is a nonverbal memory test, the only test I promised to give you today. Um, you're going to show, see a design very quickly, and then you're going to see three alternatives, and your task is to find out which one you saw before. This is a check just to make sure you're awake. So here we go. So which one of those came from? Anybody vote for the leftmost one? And the middle one? And the last one? So some of you weren't awake, clear. Okay, so what I've done before, just to get you an idea of how bad it is for a patient to fail at a cognitive test, I've put in alternatives, none of which match the first one, but those of you all correct, which is the first one. So that's a straight nonverbal memory test, and that's just to give you some ideas of the sorts of tests that you've used. And here's the first controversy, how you calculate post-operative cognitive deficit. You take a change score, and each patient is their own control. You have a preoperative score, and you compare it to the postoperative score. And then you have a criteria. How much must it have deteriorated for you to argue that there's postoperative cognitive deficits? Similar to many other classificatory systems, obesity, hypertension, dyslexia, not change scores, but absolute measures, and they're conventionally defined. This area in postoperative cognitive deficit is hugely complicated by the multiplicity of the criteria that exist to determine POCD. Let me go on to some of the data and talk a little bit about cardiac surgery and POCD. This is a study we did some years ago, and I really want to emphasize it because we've got some historical data and the changes in practice. So we had uh, these, the test that I showed you a second before, and we assessed patients before surgery, eight days following surgery, eight weeks after surgery, and 12 months. 121 subjects, the mean age is pretty low at that time, and the bypass time was quite long. But what's important is that you've got measures before surgery that you can compare to, which serves effectively as the patient's baseline. And this is what we found. You can see at eight days, about 55% of patients show deficits. And eight days is really in the area that we talk about the early stages of cognitive change. They don't persist over time. At eight weeks, you can see we have about 30%. And then 12 months, it's about 27%. So there were persisting cognitive deficits in patients 12 months after surgery. And that's important because it indicates that these are relatively stable. And indeed, we did a five-year study following a large group of patients and found the relative stability, in fact, an increase as conditions related to the brain evolved over time in five years. The predictors of deficit, and I want to do this yet again to emphasize that interminable problem of growing older, 
age and the duration of bypass were the predictors of cognitive deficit. <clears throat> what happened in the field is looking at the issues around variability in neuropsychology and cognitive outcomes following surgery and anesthesia. And the patient's factors are really quite important. Age uh, is there predominantly, but there's also cerebrovascular disease, which is really quite critical, and I'll go on to talk a bit more about that. Uh, anesthetic agents and the behavior uh, in terms of the anesthetist, the surgery, the type of surgery, and indeed the behavior of the surgeon, in terms, particularly in terms of cross-clamping and myocardial protection, are really important. And then again, it's the neuropsychological tests. It makes the field very difficult to compare because of the range of difference in practice and the range of difference in terms of the measurement of outcome. When the study was performed is also important. In, in our institution, when we were working, we instituted a whole range of changes, oxygenators, uh, filtration, uh, the behavior of the surgeon, the techniques for cross-clamping, and a range of other techniques. But we used the same cognitive tests over time. I've just shown you the early studies, and we had a significant reduction in post-operative cognitive deficits from roughly 30%, and our more recent figures are really between 9 and 11%. So significant changes in practice, but I wouldn't underestimate the significant change in the equipment. The equipment has changed radically in bypass surgery, much, more, much greater sensitivity to the nature and details of the equipment. To give you an idea of the estimate uh, of cognitive deficits following surgery, and I'll go on to the impact of cognition in a minute. If you say there's 700,000 ca ca cardiac bypass procedures uh, estimated in 2015, the number of people who would be affected would be f if a 5%, taking a lower figure of 5% incidence of POCD, would be 35,000 people. And you can see the different estimates there. This is not a small group of people we're talking about, and the impact I'll show you in a little, in a minute. The big question that people asked early and immediately attributed the problem to was the bypass machine. It must be the, the culprit. And there's evidence to suggest there are issues. There's brain swelling post-bypass, which is the Harris study. The serum concentrations of S100, a marker, are much greater in on-pump than off-pump surgery. And indeed, the post-mortem um, examinations of patients who'd undergone cardiac surgery revealed evidence of cerebral emboli. And then the fourth point, stroke rates tended to be higher on on-pump surgery. And just to show you the last one, you can see there this is a systematic uh, meta-analysis and systematic review of stroke post-surgery done in 2012. And overall, the incidence for on-pump surgery for stroke is higher. So suggesting that the brain is clearly more involved in on- than off-pump surgery. Lots of studies have been performed uh, throughout the world on, on and off pump. It was the issue of the day, especially, especially as minimally invasive surgery was being introduced. Uh, most of the studies are significantly underpowered. And they also use a range of different techniques. And some of them purposefully selected their on and off pump patients rather than using a randomized study. And the follow-up times tended to be very short. The one study that was done by Van Dyck in 2002 randomized 281 patients to on and off uh, pump surgery, and they assessed outcome cognition at three and 12 months. And the data showed a frustratingly uh, interesting difference of about P.09 in terms of cognition following the outcome. And you can see this is neuropsychological change scores, which is where the field has tended to move rather than looking at post-operative cognitive deficits. And you can see the on-pump uh, ones were worse than the off-pump in this data. Turning now to non-cardiac surgery. And one of the questions that's quite interesting to ask is simply, in a population-based study, does exposure to surgery and anesthesia increase your risk of having mild cognitive impairment? And this is an interesting study by Sprung and published this year, who took a large number of people who were aged when they assessed them at 70 to 89 years old and they identified and randomly selected this group, they got nearly 1,800 participants who were cognitively normal at the baseline evaluation and had at least one evaluation over the following period, uh, and the med median duration of follow-up was close to five years. 
And rather than get you to look at the whole slide, just look at the little bit in the box. And there you can see uh, in particular that if you had an, any anesthetic after 40 years of age, you didn't have any particular... There was no particular increase in the hazard ratio under 40. But the key one is over 60 years of age. You can see the p-value is significant and the hazards ratio is above one. So having surgery and anesthesia in a large study like this shows the likelihood of having mild cognitive impairment is increased. And this is an unselected population-based study, generally looking at it without any particular intervention and purely at the descriptive level. Interesting questions about when the surgery was conducted. The earliest studies really were done by Bedford in about 1955 in terms of looking at what happened particularly in surgery. And his approach, which is not one that I think uh, we should avoid, it's actually to ask the caretaker or the relative whether the patient has changed cognitively. That's really quite a sensitive measure. Work colleagues are also important. And he concluded that 7% of patients, and that's an important figure, the 7%, Older than 65 years of age showed cognitive deficits after undergoing general anesthesia and with respect to OLLI surgery as well. We've been looking for patients who just have anesthesia without surgery, but we couldn't find them. <clears throat> so this is a very important study uh, really done by the IFSQUAD group, uh, and the key thing I want to draw your attention to is shown in those circles. Look at the age factor, and again, age here, So there's a 60 to 69-year group, and this is the one-week one, which is the early cognitive disturbance, but the important one is here. Three months after surgery, patients aged 60 to 69, 7% of them showed POCD. And if you go to the older age group, it goes up to 14%. This is a large study and a well-conducted study and shows some good data in relation to cognitive deficits in non-cardiac surgery. And a more recent study published by Crank a couple of years ago <clears throat> looked at 225 patients, again, over 60 years of age. And this is really quite important in terms of the aging population that we face at the moment and the impact in cognition and the brain. They used a fast-track approach with opioid-sparing analgesia, early mobilization, and aimed at short length of stay. And they assessed patients preoperatively one to two weeks and then again at three months postoperatively. The incidence of POCD in particular, draw your attention to the three-month figure, was 8%. 8% of patients showing cognitive deficits in the fast track, and that indeed is very similar to patients undergoing straight non-fast track procedures. But 8% is the key again. Another figure demonstrating with people aged 60 or above roughly, demonstrating somewhere between uh, 7 and about 10% of deficits. So the extent of the problem we shouldn't underestimate. If we say there are 230 million major surgeries performed in 2012, if you take the minimal figure, a 1% incidence in POCD, 2.3 million people are affected by cognitive deficits following surgery. And that's a very generous estimate, because as you see, the figure was roughly around 7 or 8% of those aged over 60, and although a lot of these people would be aged over 60, taking it down to 1%, that's not an insignificant number of people. And emphasizes the need for us to look very carefully at cognition and to see whether there are things that we can do. Now, the field started with people looking at what is the incidence in an unselected population. What's become more interesting and indeed more important is to look at factors that influence outcome, and in particular, preoperative factors that relate to outcome. And there are a whole range of these. Age features there too under systemic. But there are also very interesting issues about looking at markers from Alzheimer's disease. And an interesting study using, uh, done in, in Australia showed a very interesting relationship between patients who had significant uh, amyloid beta, showing that relationship to the likelihood of developing POCD. But age being a really important factor but one of the other issues that really is important 
is pre-existing cognitive impairment. Patients who come to surgery are not all standardized in having a standard cognitive performance. Some demonstrate pre-existing cognitive disturbance. And what's important about these is that they demonstrate a, a vulnerability to post-operative cognitive deficits. So this is a study done by Brendan Silbert, last, published last year, again after uh, hip replacement surgery, 300 patients. And he used non-surgical controls, aged 60 years and older, like the patients, to control for any learning effects following cognitive testing. Notoriously, people demonstrate some learning. Having a control group to control for the evidence of learning and to subtract it from the patient's performance is really very important. He assessed preoperative cognitive status and defined cognitive impairment of a performance of at least two standard deviations on two or more of the seven tests when you compare them to published norms. Normative data is really important to be able to use to reference your population, and he found that when he did this, there were a significant number of people showing mild cognitive deficit. And then he used the change score using the controls to look at, uh, to control for learning in terms of the performance. And here, let me draw your attention again that outlined in the orange bar. This is the 12-month cognitive decline. If you take the, the ones who show preclinical performance, it's 9.4% demonstrated cognitive decline at 12 months of those who had preoperative cognitive problems and only 1.1% of those who didn't have preoperative cognitive disturbance demonstrated postoperative cognitive dysfunction at 12 months. So here's a vulnerability factor. And indeed, if you have a look at the MRI, you find similar changes in people who come in who have mild cognitive disturbance. So the, this particular slide is showing you hippocampal volume and if you have a look at this group, which is the ones who showed mild cognitive impairment prior to surgery, the blue shows the extent of the change on the MRI in terms of hippocampal volume. So this group, again, shows a vulnerability, the very left one of those who had no cognitive impairment prior to surgery, and the one that follows is those who had uh, Alzheimer dementia. Similar results if you have a look at gray matter volume, same factors again showing that those with mild cognitive impairment Tend to, show, tend to show changes in the MRI. The way they summarized it was the surgery appears to advance atrophy in people who have mild cognitive impairment prior to surgery by about one to two years. The question is, why are some individuals protected? What's the factor that demonstrates this? And the evidence is about higher education, which is highly correlated with higher cognitive performance, they're less likely to demonstrate POCD. The idea of a cognitive reserve is widely used in the literature. It, it suggests some kind of resilience to brain damage. And indeed, you do see changes in patients in terms of their response to surgery. And if you examine them for education and indeed for uh, intellectual performance, the cognitive reserve suggests that there's a resilience. And there are two theories around this. Either you have a larger capacity to resist brain damage, which is crudely what we call a threshold model, or you have a capacity to process information using less resource, in other words, less brain power, less brain activity, to get a similar performance. There are other factors that tend to show uh, impact, and, but all of these are highly correlated. Education, IQ, and socioeconomic factors tend to be relatively highly correlated. So what if a patient has POCD? Well, sometimes it's very important. The Secretary of State of the United States having um, coronary bypass surgery is an issue for concern if their cognition is not as good as it was before. And I'm sure we'd all feel the concerns. And I worry about how many people in the UK, given Brexit, might have been involved in having some form of cognitive <laughs> Nonetheless, the consequences are severe. I jest, because the consequences are really quite important. Generally, the risks of cognitive disturbance are really quite important. This is the well-known and highly outdated Framingham study, looking at cognitive impairment and mortality. And they assessed cognitive function in about over 2,000 patients and did an 8 to 10 year follow-up where 500 odd patients died. 
poor cognitive function is consistently associated with an increased risk of death, even after you've adjusted for those well-known factors, age, education, and illness. Subjects who scored in the bottom 26 percentile were at risk, at increased risk of mortality. This is the generic risk of poor cognitive function in terms of uh, mortality. When we have a look at bypass surgery, this is a study by Terry Monk, and it shows you four groupings. The first one, which is, and this is looking at one-year mortality, where there was no post-operative cognitive deficit, roughly 2% of patients died within 12 months. Those who had cognitive deficit on hospital discharge is just short of 3%. Those who had cognitive deficit at three months, just short of 4%. But this is the key figure. Roughly 10% of patients who had cognitive deficit at the time of hospital discharge and at three months died following surgery. So the hard outcome and its relationship to POCD is really very important. Here's another study, 701 patients. This is published by Steinmetz in 2009. One week and three months, followed up for eight and a half years. Identified post-operative cognitive deficits in 19.5% of their patients after one week. And again, here's that figure, roughly eight to 10% after three months. And this is the survival curve. And you can see the top line really shows the patients uh, without POCD. And you can see the survival rate over there. And this is the mortality, the, the survival rate rather, for those who had cognitive deficits. You don't pick it up early on, but it is picked up later on. And what's important about this uh, is that it again demonstrates in a range of different surgical techniques that POCD, indeed the brain, is an important predictor of survival. Brain function in and of its own right is an important prediction of survival. The other issues have more social consequences for individuals. Labor market withdrawal, no longer working, really an important issue for patients. And if you have a look at the response to labor market withdrawal, this shows you in that orange rectangle that patients who had early POCD were the ones who tended to withdraw from the labor market. Very often this might be provoked by family members, but having post-operative cognitive deficits is quite alarming for patients and indeed their family. And the first response, given the rough age and the opportunity that many patients have to take early retirement, is they withdraw from the labor market. If you have a look at that economic cost, it raises a range of other issues. But family disturbance and sudden withdrawal from the labor market, loss of income, loss of status, are really very important and social factors that we need to think about as we proceed. And now to the interminable question for those of you who work in the area of post-operative cognitive deficits will all be familiar with. There are a range of methodological issues and a range of issues around how you treat the data. One of the things is around control groups. If you're doing an intervention, for example, you're changing a practice using an ARES procedure and you're looking at the brain, knowing what the control group does is really important because that's where your significant difference will be determined. How better or worse or the same you are relative to a control group that you've actually determined. But when you're looking across studies, when you try to bring studies together, the behavior and the nature of the control group, what was done to the control group, is hugely variable. And I think um, the previous speaker demonstrated that very well. And you need to be careful about whether you ask people or whether you actually examine practice. But the control groups are very different. So you can come up with 20 studies, 12 of which will be significant, and you'll say, therefore, this factor is effective but it's the control groups that are determining within the study whether they are significant. So it's a variation in practice which we don't look at very carefully when we look at um, control groups. So it's important that you look carefully at control groups and you define what the control group practice is and you need to persuade journal editors to keep even as an electronic file a very clear and careful description of the control group in any of these studies. And then the interminable problem of calculation of post-operative cognitive deficit. It's an individual change score, as I said before. It's compared to their pre-operative score. 
similar to many classificatory systems, but it's all these different criteria that exist and are used. And the criteria will, by definition, influence the extent to which you find cognitive deficits in any study. Here's a study uh, published by Mahana, published some time ago, and he took uh, really four commonly used definitions of cognitive, post-operative cognitive deficit, 20% on 20% of the tests, one standard deviation on 20% of the tests, and these are unadjusted and adjusted measures. And this is the incidence rates on discharge, six weeks and six months. And you can see the characteristic curve of a decline in post-operative cognitive deficits but each of these measures, at each of the time points, is turning up different incidents of post-operative cognitive deficit. Indeed, historically, we had some very interesting studies where um, the surgeon, with great respect to our, my previous speaker, called their patients who'd had bypass surgery and said, uh, how are you doing? Can, are you thinking okay? And that was the study. Most patients said yes. Pretty difficult to turn around to somebody who saved your life and got your heart working, that uh, somehow you can't think as clearly as you can. It takes a rather self-important uh, English banker to tell you that he has a problem. But most patients are enormously grateful for that exchange uh, and, and won't complain about the fact that some things aren't working. So you need to look at the range of cognitive tests that are used and then the definition about how it's used. We've moved away and a lot of the work has moved away from looking at a at a cutoff score on continuous data and looked at a measure of post-operative cognitive change scores. Using change scores gives you one a more sensitive measure, but also it avoids that dilemma of where do you put the cutoff, as we have in a whole range of clinical areas. What's the cutoff for obesity? What's the cutoff for uh, hypertension? All interesting debates that we have, but they're conventional cutoffs that we agree, and they're various forces that drive them in some domains might well be more towards the pharmaceutical industry. The other issue that we need to be careful of is on many tests, individuals improve with repetition. We have parallel forms of tests to reduce these, but if I gave you a few more of those nonverbal memory tests, you would think of a strategy to try and improve your performance the next time we did them. And I can tell you what that strategy will be, is to concentrate in a small area of the square, and then you're likely to improve your performance. Most people think about how they performed initially on a test they've never done before. But what is important is the psychometric properties of the test vary and the amount of learning differs in tests. So this is a study done by Keith in 2004, and I'm illustrating this to show you the improvement in the control group in terms of cognitive tests. If we look initially at the visual attention measure, which is shown here, the open circles are the control group. And the control group shows significant improvement over time. And that's true of all the tests to a varying degree. It shows you again the open circles on visual spatial memory, on digit span, and on paired associate learning all showed significant changes over time. And what's important about that is we need to account for it in our studies but not only account for it, we need to find some way of dealing it with it in the analysis. So this shows you uh, the sorts of performance that you might expect at doing a study where there's significant cognitive deficit shown here, level of performance on the vertical axis, pre-op and post-op. Some patients will do badly. Some patients will show significant improvement just by learning how to deal with the test. And you'll end up with a mean that shows an overall improvement. And if you look historically at the literature, some people suggested doing coronary bypass surgery resulted in improvement in cognition. While that's true for some patients, the important issue here is that you would expect learning to take place. Some level of learning on some of these tests would take place, and you need to control for it, and there are techniques and tools for controlling for learning, for subtracting the learning effect on each of the tests. However, another problem if you look through the literature is that the number of cognitive tests used will influence whether you find POCD. And this is a classic study done by Lewis in 2006 and what he's called their tasks, two to seven tasks, two tasks all the way through to seven, 
and the incidence of POCD is on the vertical axis. And if you define POCD as a decline in two or more tests, you can see you're more likely to get a decline in two or more tests purely for statistical reasons if you have seven rather than two tests. So the likelihood is going to increase and you need to be very careful when you review some of the tests, some of the studies in terms of the number of neuropsychological tests they've used and the definition that they've used. When tests are given also affects it because what's clear is surgery and anesthesia have changed over time and this is a systematic review done by Patel published last year where they looked at the percentage estimated uh, cognitive decline and when the tests were done and you can see here a gradual drop in the percentage of patients showing cognitive decline through to one year. So if you give tests early on as I said before you're more likely to find POCD. If you do it later on you find less stability in terms of POCD. The five-year follow-ups are very interesting, three to five years, because if you assume that mild cognitive impairment is going to evolve over time, what happens to the patient simply with the duration of time is they're likely to show increased cognitive deficits than they had three to five years previously. So one needs to be very careful in reviewing the literature when that happens. Many intervention studies have been conducted, <clears throat> and these have looked at whether you, by the introduction of a technique you can actually improve cognitive outcome. <clears throat> and with the decline of POCD, if it's going to be used in these studies, you have a real issue in terms of the numbers required to examine. The power of the study is a big issue in this area. You'll see many studies with about 50 patients in each group, giving a huge instability to the findings because they're not adequately powered. Realistically, <clears throat> if you really want to do a proper study and you've got an incidence in your control group of 10% and you've got an intervention which you're presuming will halve the incidence, you need to have 432 people in each group. We now need sizable studies because the incidence of POCD has declined. And then if you change it from 15% in the control group and you have an intervention that reduces the, to 10%, you need over 1,300 patients in the group. So th the time has come when we need to do very large studies if we're going to get any traction. If we stick to the deficit model of post-operative cognitive change, my preference would be to use a change score which use, gives you a continuous measure and gives you greater sensitivity. This is just some work that we did and published in 2007 looking at um, odds ratios and confidence intervals in relation to the size of the study that followed up patients between 22 days and six months. And you can see the first five studies on that list with the low sample size all crossed the equality mark, which is the horizontal line there. It's only the study done by Moller, which has a sizable sample of over a thousand, which demonstrated a confidence in our findings because the, the odds ratios did not cross the zero line. Now the real problems about doing systematic reviews in a moving field <clears throat> and here the moving field consists of surgery and anesthesia, uh, the definition of post-operative cognitive deficits, the test used and the time of follow-up. So the systematic reviews have an inherent problem of heterogeneity in this area. Changes over time, we know surgery and anesthesia have changed significantly, therefore there's a time issue. If you introduce studies done in the 1990s and compare them to studies done in 2010s, you really have an issue about whether you're examining the same interventional phenomenon. The differences, as I mentioned, in test selection, the psychometric qualities of the test would vary, and if you take the author's definition of POCD, you've got a real problem, and I've demonstrated to you also the number of neuropsychological tests that people have used and then in turn the calculation of the deficit and the differences in the use of control groups and the, indeed the increase for larger samples. Nonetheless, we do have a problem of synthesis but I think we also have clear evidence that cognition is and should be on all our agendas. It has devastating effect to patients it's predictive of mortality, it's predictive of a range of other factors, and looking at the brain when you assess cognition, when you assess surgery and anesthesia, seems to me should be on everybody's agenda. It certainly is on the agenda of patients and their families. Thank you very much.
I'd like to extend my thanks to Stanton for a wonderful presentation, uh, for an extraordinarily comprehensive review of this topic. And I'd like to say there were two things that I was relieved about. Um, the first one was that I'm not yet 60, so hopefully that gives me some reserve. And the second was that even though this is a room full of a huge amount of cognitive reserve, um, I suspect I wasn't the only person who'd briefly forgotten that this was in fact Sunday morning until David invited us to the early morning Sunday morning session. I'd briefly forgotten that it was Sunday, so I suspect there might have been a few others who'd forgotten that it was um, Sunday. Uh, it's a complex area, and uh, it's one that I'm really pleased that the ASA have taken on with their new brain health initiative. Clearly there are massive consequences for our patients in terms of mortality and loss of um, their capacity to work. And I'm sure there are many in this room who understand the deep personal and social consequences of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. I'd actually like to just briefly ask Stan back come onto the stage to receive our gift and hopefully he enjoys his Melbourne monopoly. So if you wouldn't mind just coming up again briefly, Stan. Just to thank you again, very much indeed, if you'll accept that on thank our you, behalf. Thank you. And, um, thank you. Thank you. Don't go yet. Um, and then the organizers have also given him a, a large paperweight, but I suspect it also provides an opportune moment for us to remind you to purchase one of the raffle tickets. So this is just a, not a very subtle reminder from the organizers to purchase your raffle ticket. That might include you as well, Stanton. Please feel free. So that. I think I've got the prize there. <laughs> yeah, this is the big one. So that's for you as well. Thanks, and thank you very much indeed once again. I'd like you just to thank Stanton again.